Oops. If you're just joined this session, uh, uh, let me say we're uh, gradually gathering our virtual room full of participants for Maria Giovanna Mora's uh, plenary talk. And we will begin in a couple of minutes. Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, session IP11. This is a plenary talk uh, by Maria Giovanna Mora. Uh, a, a, a tiny bit of orientation first. Uh, on your Zoom screen, you will see a place at the bottom called Q&A and another place called chat. Uh, we, uh, Maria Giovanna will be taking questions uh, at the end of the talk. You may post questions at any time using, I prefer the Q&A uh, window, but it's also possible to use the chat window. And uh, if your question is simple to state, you can put it right there and I will repeat it. Uh, if uh, it's more complicated, uh, we will call on you to formulate it yourself. Uh, right now, I want to introduce uh, Maria Giovanna briefly. She is Professor of Mathematical Analysis at the University of Pavia in Italy. Uh, in terms of her background, she did a master's at the University of Parma, then a PhD at CISA in Trieste. Uh, getting that degree, the PhD in 2001. Afterwards, she was a postdoc for two years at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences in Leipzig, then assist assistant professor from 2003 to 2011 CISA. She's well known to many people in this audience, uh, being the author of more than 40 research articles on a diverse family of topics mostly addressing problems in the calculus of variations, usually with a focus on problems from material science. Uh, today, we're very happy to have Professor Mora speaking about equilibrium, equilibrium measures for non-local interaction energies, the role of anisotropy. The floor is yours, Maria Giovanni. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, let me also thank the organizers for this invitation and the opportunity of giving this uh, virtual talk. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is based on a few papers in collaboration with several people, Jose Antonio Carillo from uh, Oxford, Joan Matteo and Joan Verdera from Barcelona, Luca Rondi from Milano and Lucia Scardia from Edinburgh. So the topic is that of non-local interaction energies. In a few words, non-local interaction equations 
are continuum models for large systems of particles where each particle can uh, interact not only with its neighbors, but also with particles that are very far away. Uh, those kind of uh, systems, so no local interaction systems, uh, can be found uh, in uh, many different applications. So for instance, uh, in biology, in the study of population dynamics, uh, in mathematical physics, uh, and also in material science. Uh, two typical examples of non-local interaction in material science are the theory of Ginzburg-Landau vortices and the dislocation theory. So in fact, in this talk, I will start from an example in dislocation theory. I'll also say a few words about dislocations. And then at the end of the talk, I'll try to deduce from this example some general principles about um, the role of the anisotropy of the interaction kernel uh, on the structure of the optimal configuration of particles. In particular, I'll try to uh, understand how the anisotropy of the interaction may affect the dimensionality, that is the dimension of the support of the measure representing the uh, distribution of, of particles at equilibrium. So let me be more specific. So uh, the energy we are going to focus on uh, coming from this location theory is this functional i, which is defined on probability measures in the plane. And uh, in the application to this location theory, a measure mu represents the density of these locations at a continuum scale, at a mesoscopic scale. So given a certain distribution of particles, uh, mu, the energy of mu is given by uh, this functional where we have two terms. So the first term is a typical interaction energy. It's a convolution type uh, of integral. So it's uh, the convolution of the kernel W with the measure mu, and then you take integration with respect to mu. So the kernel, the interaction kernel, has a very specific structure coming from this location theory. So it's given by the Coulomb kernel in 2D minus the logarithm plus this anisotropy x1 squared over modulus of x squared. Uh, the last term in the energy is called the confinement and uh, uh, it involves a potential V which can be smooth. For instance, it can be a power law as a modulus of x squared or it could be the indicator of a compact set. So that is a function which is zero on a compact set and plus infinity outside the compact set. And in this case, what we are prescribing is that our measures are uh, supported on this given compact set. Okay, from a mathematical point of view, uh, what we can observe is that the Coulomb kernel has a repulsive effect. So if two particles come too close uh, to each other, then uh, uh, since we have minus the logarithm, we get a large contribution in the interaction energy. But uh, this effect is compensated by the presence of the confinement that instead becomes very large when particles spread around in the plane. So there is an interplay between the logarithm and the confinement so that the overall behavior turns out to be uh, repulsive at short distances and attractive at larger distances. And so this is what makes uh, the problem mathematically interesting. On top of that, we have this uh, anisotropy that may look rather innocuous at a first sight because it's just uh, a bounded perturbation of the logarithm. But uh, it's clear that this anisotropy introduces a preferred direction into the problem. And in particular, it makes the problem non-radially symmetric. And I say this because we will see that radial symmetry is a typical assumption in non-local interaction systems. And so this is an assumption that will not be satisfied in our example, in our case. So to give some motivation for the study of this functional I, let me mention that I comes out as a many particle limit in the sense that we can consider um, somehow the discrete version of i, so we take as mu a sum of Dirac deltas at the points z1, z2, zn, and what we obtain is a discrete energy describing the interaction of n dislocations in the plane located at the point z1, z2, zn. 
And if you take the limit as n, the number of particles goes to infinity, uh, you get exactly the energy i. So for instance, the limit can be taken in the sense of gamma convergence. And so in particular, this means that minimizers of i are relevant in the sense that they describe the asymptotic behavior of minimizers of en. In other words, minimizers of i describe the optimal configuration of particles when the number of particles is sufficiently large. Okay, now I would like to say a few words about uh, these locations. So probably uh, many of you uh, doesn't know much, do not know much about these locations. So let me say just a few words. Uh, what are these locations and why are they relevant? Um, so these locations are uh, one-dimensional uh, defects in the crystal structure of a metal, and they are relevant because they are considered to be uh, one of the main mechanisms of plastic deformation, so of, of permanent deformation in metals. So in reality, the geometry of these locations may be very complex. So typically, uh, these location lines are curves, that can form loops, they can be entangled, so the geometry is very complicated. And uh, uh, describing uh, these locations in this full generality is a very challenging problem, uh, both from a mathematical and a mechanical point of view. So what I'm referring uh, uh, to here is a model of idealized dislocations, where we assume that all these locations lines are straight and parallel, and moreover, we assume, uh, we assume these locations to be of edge type. Uh, so this means that the defect in the crystal is of the kind shown in this picture. So here you can see a lattice with some distortion. And the distortion is due to the presence of uh, an half plane of atoms, an extra half plane of atoms, this one. So this produces a local distortion of the crystal. And uh, in this picture, what is called the dislocation line is the boundary of this extra half plane of atoms. So it's the line going through this point orthogonal to the screen. So we assume that all these locations are of this kind. And so because of these geometrical assumptions, we can describe the behavior of these locations in a two dimensional setting. In other words, we can imagine to take a, a cross section, a two dimensional cross section of the lattice orthogonal to the dislocation lines. And in this two-dimensional domain, we can identify uh, each dislocation line with its uh, intersection with the two-dimensional cross-section. And so this is the reason why we can describe these locations as points uh, in a two-dimensional domain. Uh, we also assume that all these locations uh, have the same uh, Burgers vector that we assume to be E1 for simplicity. So the Burgers vector is the vector measuring the amount and the direction of the distortion due to the dislocation. And basically what it means is that those extra half plane of atoms that uh, correspond to these locations are all in the, in the top part, in the upper part of the, of the crystal. Okay, so now we uh, model um, these locations using a um, semi-discrete uh, approach in the sense that we assume to be at a scale where we can forget about the lattice, so we don't see the lattice structure anymore, but we still see uh, these locations as point singularity. So in such a way that we have point singularities corresponding to these locations, and outside these locations we can use a continuum models. We can do that because typically the distance between the two dislocations is much larger than the atomic distance in the lattice. And so we can assume to be at a scale where we don't see the lattice, but we still see these locations as points. And in this framework, we can use as a continuum theory outside these locations, linearized elasticity. And uh, in this setting, we can compute uh, the force generated by a dislocation on uh, other dislocations. So for instance, assume to have a dislocation located at zero, we can compute the force that this dislocation produces on another dislocation located at X. And if you compute this force, what you find out is that the force up to a constant is uh, equal to minus the gradient of a kernel, 
where the kernel is exactly the one I have introduced in the previous slide. So this is just to say that this particular expression of the kernel really comes out from a specific model in this location theory. Okay, now let me comment a little bit more on this force. So we have a dislocation at zero that produces this force, which is minus the gradient of W. W has two components, the logarithm and the anisotropy. And so the force has two components as well, one given by the gradient of the logarithm and one given by the gradient of the anisotropy. So the force given by the gradient of the logarithm is represented in this picture by the red arrows. And so as you can see, it's a repulsive force in the radial direction. So uh, if we have a dislocation at x, because of the dislocation at zero, this dislocation at x will be pushed far away from the origin. So this repulsive effect will be compensated by the confinement term, which is not taken into account in this picture. And then the force has a second component due to the gradient of the anisotropy, represented by the blue arrows. And this is a force which is orthogonal to the radial direction and points towards the vertical axis. So if we have a dislocation at x, this dislocation is pushed onto the vertical axis. In other words, the two dislocations tend to align themselves vertically. So from this uh, picture, it's not, it's not hard to believe in the mechanical conjecture, uh, which is based also on experimental observation, uh, which says that uh, uh, under these assumptions at equilibrium, these locations um, tend to arrange themselves in such a way to stay on top of each other. So to form vertical one-dimensional structures, which are called dislocation walls. So now the question is whether we can prove this conjecture rigorously from a mathematical point of view. In other words, can we show uh, that the minimizer of our energy I um, has this vertical one-dimensional support, has this vertical one-dimensional structure. So from this picture, the conjecture uh, is, uh, seems to be very natural, but of course this picture is not a proof. And moreover, in this picture, we are looking at a very simplified situation where we are dealing only with two particles, only two dislocations, while in general, we will have many dislocations. So what happens in this case? So what we would like to do is to give a rigorous proof uh, to see if we can give a rigorous proof of this mechanical conjecture. Okay, before discussing uh, this, I would like to uh, start from uh, um, an easier uh, case, which is the one where the interaction is purely uh, Coulomb. So assume for the moment that there is no anisotropy in the kernel. And so the kernel is just given by minus the logarithm. Then the minimization of this energy uh, turns out to be a classical problem in potential theory uh, that goes back at least to Gauss. So it corresponds to the so-called capacitance problem. So the problem of finding uh, the equilibrium configuration of uh, charges in a capacitor or under the effect of an external field. So this problem was uh, rigorously solved by Frostman around uh, 1930. And uh, actually this energy uh, occurs in a variety of different applications. So not only electrostatics, but also uh, just to name a few, Coulomb gases, random matrix theory, interpolation theory, and many authors have worked on, um, on, this, uh, on this energy and um, on its uh, minimizer. So about the minimization of, uh, of this energy, so in the purely Coulomb case, what, we can, uh, what one can prove uh, is the following. So if the confinement term is good enough, so is lower semi-continuous and grows faster than the logarithm at infinity, then one can show that the minimizer exists, is unique, and is compactly supported. And moreover, for some uh, choices of the confinement, one can uh, uh, give an explicit, uh, uh, one can find explicitly the minimizer. So for instance, if uh, V is modulus of X squared, uh, the minimizer of the energy is given by the circle law, the so-called circle law. So this is a distribution 
supported on the unit ball centered at zero with the uniform density given by one over pi because we are working with probability measure. So now the question is whether we can uh, repeat uh, this kind of results, so this plan, for, uh, so in the case of anisotropy. So now let's reintroduce the anisotropy. Can we adapt those results that were proved for purely Coulomb interaction? So at this stage, uh, what we did was to look at the literature and look at what kind of results are available, were available in the literature for this kind of non-local interaction energies. And uh, the results uh, uh, that you have in the literature are typically of two uh, kinds. So the first group of results are uh, um, explicit characterization of the minimizer. And uh, uh, you can find uh, uh, many examples, well, some examples of this explicit uh, characterization in uh, uh, the classical book on potential theory by Safed Tutik. But those examples are only done for the Coulomb kernel, not only in 2D, also in higher dimension, and for radially symmetric uh, confinements. And the reason is that uh, the, those explicit characterizations are strongly based on the fact that the Coulomb kernel is the fundamental solution of the Laplacian and on the radial symmetry assumptions. And these, of course, are two properties that are not true for our anisotropic kernel. And then the second group of results um, is about much more general non-local interaction energies, so not only Coulomb kernel, but much more general interaction kernels. And uh, in those papers, uh, the, the goal uh, is to establish uh, qualitative properties of minimizers, uh, such as, for instance, uh, uniqueness, uh, symmetry, confinement, and, and so on. So here, the literature is really huge, and uh, so this is a very partial account on, uh, on the literature. Uh, but again, a typical assumption that you have in, uh, in these papers is radial symmetry that we don't have. And uh, about the dimensionality of minimizers, so the dimension of the support, uh, which is uh, what is interesting to us, uh, having in mind the mechanical conjecture, uh, the only paper uh, we are aware of is an interesting uh, article by Balaghe, Carillo, Laurent, and Raoul, where they uh, give a lower bound on uh, the dimensionality. So it's just a lower bound, it's not a full characterization. And moreover, unfortunately, it doesn't apply to the critical singularity of the logarithm. So it doesn't apply to our kernel. So it seems that our kernel does not fit into any of these frameworks. So it seems that introducing the anisotropy is really something new that um, was not considered, or at least to which the, the classical, so what is available in the literature, uh, does, not, uh, does not apply. So nevertheless, what we were able to prove is uh, the following result. So assume that the confinement is modulus of x squared, and let us consider the dislocation interaction kernel, so the logarithm plus the anisotropy. So what we proved with Luca Rondi and Lucia Scardia is that for this functional, the minimizer exists, is unique, and can be still uh, explicitly characterized, and it's given by a known uh, measure. It's uh, the so-called semicircle law on the vertical axis. So this is a measure that is uh, supported on a segment on the vertical axis. So it's the segment minus square root of 2 square root of 2. And uh, the density is not uniform, but it's given by the square root of 2 minus x2 square. So if you draw uh, the graph of this function, you get a semicircle. And this is why the name of, of this measure. So if you consider um, this measure in, uh, in 1D, this is a known measure because it's the minimizer of the uh, logarithmic interaction energy in uh, 1D. And what we are saying here is that if you look at this measure as a measure in the plane on the vertical axis, this is the minimizer of this uh, uh, anisotropic interaction energy with confinement modulus of x squared. So this result is uh, surprising because first of all, it's uh, um, the, the first, as far as we know, is the first explicit characterization of the minimizer 
for a kernel that is not uh, radially symmetric. And uh, going back to uh, the mechanical conjecture, we proved that at least for this confinement, uh, for this choice of the confinement, the uh, optimal distribution has a vertical wall-like uh, structure. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, what is interesting from a mathematical point of view is uh, uh, the effect of the anisotropy on the shape of the minimizer. So the anisotropy has a dramatic effect on the shape of the minimizer. In fact, if there's no anisotropy, so if the interaction is purely Coulomb, uh, then we know that the minimizer is the, uh, the circle law, so a uniform distribution on a two-dimensional set. If we introduce an isotropy, the minimizer is completely different, so the support is 1D and the density is not uniform. So uh, this uh, role of the anisotropy uh, looked very interesting to us, and so we try to understand better how the anisotropy uh, may really affect the dimensionality of the minimizer, the dimension of the support. So in order to do that, we uh, considered the following uh, uh, functionals, the following variant of the energy, where we have now a parameter alpha in front of the anisotropy, in such a way to tune the strength of the anisotropy inside the interaction kernel. And so what we would like to do is to uh, characterize, to study the minimizers of this energy I alpha, again in the class of probability measures. So the questions that we would like to address are the following. So first of all, um, well, the first question is, of course, the existence of minimizers. So if minimizers uh, don't exist, then there's not much to discuss. And uh, moreover, we expect the minimizers to be compactly supported because of the confinement. Another natural question is, of course, uniqueness. And then what is uh, uh, really interesting to us is uh, uh, the dimension of the support of the minimizer. So can we characterize the dimension of the support? And so how the, the anisotropy, so we know that for alpha equal to zero, the dimension of the support is two, for alpha equal to one is one. So what happens for intermediate values of alpha? And then, uh, of course, the optimal result would be to find the minimizers explicitly also for every alpha, uh, since, uh, uh, well, it was done for alpha equal to zero classical, we did it for alpha equal to one, can we find the minimizer explicitly also for a general alpha? Okay, so this is somehow the, the plan that I would like to follow. And the first remark that one can do is that by symmetry argument, um, it's actually enough to study the case where the parameter alpha is in between zero and one. So really in between the uh, Coulomb case and the dislocation uh, case. Okay, concerning, uh, uh, so this is our functional with uh, this parameter alpha in between zero and one in front of the anisotropy and the confinement term is still modulus of x squared. So concerning existence and compact support, uh, those results are uh, standard. So here we can really apply the general theory of uh, uh, non-local interaction systems and the anisotropy plays absolutely no role. So existence follows by uh, the direct method of the calculus variations, uh, while um, the fact that minimizers have compact support uh, follows from the fact that the, the overall potential, so the interaction uh, kernel plus the confinement, uh, blows up uh, at infinity. And so using this property, you can show that it's not convenient to send mass at infinity. In other words, minimizers must be compactly supported. So this is quite easy and standard. What is less uh, standard is uh, uniqueness. So in general, there's, there's no uh, standard way to prove uniqueness for this kind of problem. And in our case, uh, uniqueness uh, follows from uh, uh, this lemma. So alpha is in between zero and one. We take two probability measures that have a finite interaction energy and compact support. Then what you can show is that the interaction uh, um, energy on the difference is always non-negative and actually is different from zero if the two measures are different. And so from this lemma, you can easily deduce the strict convexity of the functional 
at least uh, on the class of function on the class of measures with finite interaction energy and compact support but since uh, minimizers uh, uh, satisfy these two properties strict convexity on this class of measures provides uniqueness of the minimizer okay here i would like to say just a few words about the proof of this lemma uh, also in comparison with uh, uh, the purely Coulomb case. For purely Coulomb uh, interaction, uh, the same lemma with the identical statement holds. And this is in fact the way you prove uniqueness in the Coulomb case. And there are several proofs. So a possible proof of the lemma in the Coulomb case is the following. You approximate the Coulomb kernel by the risk kernel, which is given by a constant times x to the power beta minus two for beta less than two and coincides with the Coulomb kernel for beta equal to. So for beta less than two, you have this uh, relation. You can show that the risk kernel k beta coincides with the convolution of k beta uh, over two with itself. And so now if you look uh, at the interaction using the risk kernel, you use this property, this convolution property you change the order of, the, of integration and uh, you find out that your risk interaction energy is the integral of a positive quantity. So it is positive. And so basically the lemma is proved. And then to uh, prove the lemma for the Coulomb case, you just have to pass the limit as beta tends to two. There's only a small detail to take into account. So the, this constant C beta in the risk kernel blows up as beta tends to two. So you have to somehow normalize this, uh, this quantity. So you need to take, <clears throat> to consider, so you can, you can pass the limit only on measures uh, that are zero, that have integral zero on the whole plane. And this property is satisfied under the assumptions of the lemma because nu is the difference of two probability measures. So its integral on the whole plane is in fact equal to zero. So this is uh, uh, the way you can prove the dilemma for the Coulomb case. Now, if we have an isotropy, it's not clear at all why this proof should work and how, uh, how to adapt this kind of computation. And uh, in fact, we decided to uh, follow a different strategy uh, that consists in writing uh, the interaction energy in the Fourier space in such a way that the convolution product becomes a true product. And so if we are able to show that the Fourier transform of our kernel is positive, then we are done. The interaction energy is positive. So we computed the Fourier transform of our anisotropic kernel. And unfortunately, so this is, this is the expression which is not very nice. Uh, and unfortunately, what you can see is that the Fourier transform is not positive. So this looks very bad because, uh, well, this looked like a good idea, but apparently it doesn't work. So actually, there's still uh, something that we didn't use in the proof, and it's the following remark. So if we consider test functions that are equal to zero at zero, then the Fourier transform reduces to this expression which is, uh, so simplifies to this, to this expression, which is positive for positive test functions, as long as alpha is in between minus one and one, which is our case. And it's enough to have positivity on test functions which are zero at zero, because again, we are working with measures that have integral zero on the whole plane. And so if you take the Fourier transform, you get a function that is equal to zero at zero. And this is exactly the test function we have here. So positivity on test functions which are zero at zero is actually enough to, um, to get the positivity of the interaction kernel on the kind of measures that are provided by the lemma. So this is the basic idea uh, behind the proof. And uh, before going on, I would like to uh, just uh, uh, to make just a small uh, remark. So here, the Fourier transform, the, this numerator is a positive definite uh, quadratic form, depending on those coefficients, one minus alpha, one plus alpha. So the two values, alpha equal to one uh, and alpha equal to minus one, are uh, in a sense critical values for the Fourier transform, in the sense that are values at which 
we lose coercivity, in a sense, of the Fourier transform. I will go back to this point at the end of the talk. Okay, so, so far what we know is that for alpha in between 0 and 1, uh, the minimizer exists, is unique, is compactly supported, and so the question is whether we can characterize it in any way. In particular, can we say something about its support? So at this stage, we tried some numerical tests. Uh, so we went back to the discrete version of the energy and we used a gradient descent method. And this is a numerical uh, result for uh, alpha equal to one over four. So from this numerical test, uh, it seems that the support uh, is a two dimensional ellipse. This is not surprising. For alpha equal to zero, we have a circle. For alpha equal to one, we have a vertical segment. So the ellipse is somehow something in between. And the distribution of particles uh, seems to be rather uniform. So could be constant. Then for alpha equal to one over two, this is, uh, this is a test that we obtained. So again, uh, the support uh, is an ellipse. Is the distribution uniform? Not very clear. It seems that there are some vertical alignments of particles. And the situation is even less clear for alpha equal to three over four. The support uh, is again, looks again like an ellipse. Is the distribution uniform? Not very clear. And uh, in fact, uh, um, at the beginning, so after some preliminary uh, computations, we were somehow convinced that uh, the distribution of particles uh, shouldn't be con constant. And in trying to prove this uh, conjecture, actually we ended up uh, proving that uh, the density is actually constant. The density of the optimal measure of the minimizer is in fact uh, uniform on the support. So how do we prove this result? Well, first of all, uh, we have some equivalent condition to uh, minimality. So for alpha in between zero and one, you can show that minimality is equivalent to the Euler-Lagrange conditions, so to first order uh, minimality conditions. And this is because our energy for alpha in between zero and one is uh, convex. And the Euler-Lagrange conditions uh, read as follows. Uh, there exists a constant such that uh, the potential function given by the convolution of the kernel with the measure plus one half the confinement has to be equal to this constant in the support of the measure. And the same function has to be above this constant elsewhere in the plane. So the constant is not prescribed a priori. So the two condition uh, say simply that there exists a constant such that these two uh, equations are satisfied. Uh, if you are able to identify the minimizer, you can then compute the constant simply by integrating the first equation with respect to mu. And so you can find the value of C alpha. So these two conditions together are equivalent to minimality owing to convexity. So in order to prove minimality, you need to find a measure mu alpha satisfying uh, at the same time condition one and two. And so the main result is the following. So for alpha uh, between zero and one, uh, the measure given by, so supported on uh, the ellipse of semi-axis square root one minus alpha square root one plus alpha, and of density, of constant density given by one over the area of the ellipse satisfies the two Euler-Lagrange equations. And so it's the unique minimizer of the functional I alpha. So the global picture is uh, the following. So for alpha equal to zero, no anisotropy, the minimizer is given by a uniform distribution on the two dimensional circle. As we add anisotropy into the problem, the distribution remains uh, uniform, but the support uh, becomes, is given by an ellipse elongated on uh, the vertical axis. As we increase the anisotropy, the density uh, remains constant, but the two-dimensional ellipse becomes more and more elongated on the vertical axis. And it's only at alpha equal to one that those ellipses get uh, squeezed on the vertical axis and we get uh, um, a measure with a one-dimensional support, with support on the vertical axis. And for alpha negative, we have uh, asymmetric behavior 
So for alpha in between minus one and zero, we get a uniform distribution on an ellipse elongated on the horizontal axis. And for alpha equal to minus one, we get the semicircle law on the horizontal axis. Okay, now I don't have much time to uh, talk about the proof. Uh, let me just say uh, a couple of words. So, um, well, first of all, um, what we need to do is to show that for this measure, uh, for this explicit measure, mu alpha, the two other Lagrange equations are uh, satisfied. And to prove condition one, uh, since this is an equality, we need uh, an explicit Uh, expression of this uh, potential function. So we need to know exactly what this potential function is uh, because we need to show an equality on the support of the measure. Uh, in the remaining part of the plane, we just need to prove an inequality. So one can think that uh, estimates are enough. Uh, this is uh, not really true in the sense that uh, those two conditions we have seen are equivalent to minimality. So this means that they are satisfied only by the minimizer and they fail on any other measure. And so this suggests that uh, uh, rough estimates uh, probably will not work because this is only satisfied by the specific measure given by the minimizer. And in fact, what we did uh, is to um, compute explicitly the potential function for our anisotropic kernel and for a measure given by the characteristic function of a two-dimensional ellipse. And this can be done because uh, the Coulomb potential, so if you just take the logarithm convolution with the characteristic function of an ellipse, this potential has an explicit formula, which is well known in uh, fluid mechanics. So the logarithmic part somehow is already known. We just need to compute the anisotropic part. And this can be done because our anisotropy has a special form in a sense. So its Laplacian is, is related to derivatives of the logarithm. And so using this property, you can uh, deduce the expression of the anisotropic potential starting from the expression of the logarithmic potential. Okay, let me skip uh, this part of the proof. And uh, in the time which is left, I would like to um, comment a little bit on, on this result. So we saw that uh, the two values alpha equal to one and alpha equal to minus one correspond to a drastic drop of dimensionality, a drastic change of dimensionality from two to one. And uh, we noticed before that those values are uh, also critical for the Fourier transform. They correspond to a degeneracy of the Fourier transform, or if you prefer, to a degeneracy of the associated differential operator. So what you can show is that the by Laplacian of our interaction kernel is uh, uh, given by this expression. So it's a sort of anisotropic uh, Laplacian that becomes degenerate for alpha equal to one or alpha equal to minus one. So a natural question is whether there is some relation between these two facts. Can we deduce a general principle relating the change, the drop of dimensionality with the degeneracy of the Fourier transform? And so in, in order to understand a little bit better this question, we tried to reproduce the behavior that we saw in this example in higher dimensions. And so a good uh, choice of the interaction kernel in Rn is uh, the following one. So you replace uh, the logarithm by the Coulomb kernel, one over x uh, uh, to the power n minus two. And uh, as an isotropy, you consider x one square over x to the power n. And uh, the reason uh, why this is a good choice is that if you look at the by Laplacian of this uh, kernel, you get a completely analogous structure to the one we had in 2D. So now the critical values are n minus two and minus n plus two. Okay, so uh, what you can show is that uh, the Coulomb potential of uh, an n-dimensional ellipsoid has an explicit formula. And so using uh, uh, this fact, and again, the particular structure of the anisotropy, Uh, you can compute the uh, global potential of an n-dimensional ellipsoid and show that this satisfies for suitable choices of the semi-axis 
the uh, Euler-Lagrange equations. So in other words, what we proved is that for alpha, uh, let us look for simplicity at alpha positive. So for alpha in between zero and n minus two, uh, the minimizer for this choice uh, of uh, the interaction kernel, the confinement is still modulus of x square, uh, exists, is unique, and is given by an n-dimensional ellipsoid. But this is true up to the critical value n minus two included. So in other words, in this n-dimensional variant of the problem, there is no drop of dimensionality. The minimizer stays n-dimensional up to the critical value n minus two. And so what we can uh, say is that at least for smooth confinements, the degeneracy of the Fourier transform does not imply necessarily loss of dimensionality of the minimizer. So what is probably true, and I think uh, Jose Antonio Carrillo is working on that, um, is the converse implication. So in other words, as long as uh, uh, your Fourier transform is not degenerate, your minimizer should be uh, fully dimensional. So in other words, you shouldn't observe loss of dimensionality if you don't have uh, degeneracy. Okay, just to conclude, I would like to mention the case of other confinements. So what I said so far uh, was for the confinement modulus of x squared, what happens if you choose a different confinement uh, potential? So for instance, let us consider the physical confinement given by uh, the indicator function of uh, the ball of radius r. So in other words, we uh, prescribe the, we assume that the support of our measures are, uh, is contained in uh, uh, the ball of radius r. So, um, under, uh, so in this case, for the Coulomb interaction, you can show that the minimizer is given by a uniform distribution on the boundary of the ball. So particles go to the boundary and distribute uh, themselves uh, in, a, um, in a uniform way. And what we proved together with a student of mine, Alessandro Scagliotti, is that for this physical confinement, um, if we um, introduce an isotropy into the kernel, the minimizer stays the same. So it's still given by a uniform distribution, the uniform distribution on the boundary of the ball. So uh, in some sense, the physical confinement is stronger than the anisotropy, so particles uh, go to the boundary, even in the presence of the anisotropy. What is surprising is that the anisotropy has no effect at all, in this case, on the limiting distribution. So the distribution is still uniform on the boundary of the ball. So um, probably this is due to uh, symmetry uh, properties of the ball, but it's rather surprising. So um, the behavior of, of, the, of the minimizer is completely different from the case of the confinement modulus of x squared. Um, so um, summarizing, we have uh, several examples uh, of uh, explicit minimizers uh, that show how the uh, anisotropy may or may not affect the dimensionality, but clearly there's still a lot to be, to be understood in, uh, in, this, uh, in this problem. So I stop here, I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm ready for your question. Thank you. Okay, uh, are there any questions from the audience? I would encourage you to use the Q&A button if you want to ask questions. Meanwhile, while you collect your thoughts, I will use the chair's prerogative to ask a question myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> you're, your simulations were interesting, uh, and they showed a sort of rather clear patterns of uh, vertical lines, more or less two length scales, right? The horizontal length scale, and uh, is, do you have any, have you thought a little bit about what it would take to do analysis that reflects that? Well, this is an interesting question. Um, so actually, it's, it's not clear whether these vertical alignments of particles that we see in the numerical tests are an effect of, of our numerics, which probably is not particularly good, or it's really a pattern. So in the case of the Coulomb potential, uh, Sandier Serfati 
um, did an analysis at the microscopic scale. So what they do is to study, start from the discrete energy and somehow blow up at the typical scale at what we expect to be the, the, the typical scale at the discrete level in such a way to get uh, information on how you approximate at the discrete level the uniform distribution on the ball. So um, it would be uh, interesting to see if something similar can be done also for our anisotropic interaction and uh, whether one can show that uh, those vertical alignments at the discrete level are really the way you approximate uh, the, the semicircle law. So this is uh, something really interesting that we would like to, to understand. Okay, let me pick up a question from the audience. This one is from Johannes Osborne. Uh, mm -hmm. Question is, what can be said if the physical confinement is given by some more general domain, perhaps a Lipschitz domain even? So for uh, the Coulomb potential, I think you can show uh, that particles go to the boundary and tends to concentrate uh, at, the, at the angles. So if there are uh, angles, uh, particles tend to concentrate there. For an isotropic interaction, so for this, uh, for my kernel, nothing is known. So already uh, getting the minimizer for, for the ball was uh, something unexpected. So uh, I don't know for, for the case of an isotropy, but for the Coulomb case, I think uh, something uh, has been proved. So particles tend, tend to go to the boundary and they concentrate at the, at the angles. I see. So the circle is like the limit of polygons. The particles would have clustered at the vertices of the polygon, the and then they get yeah. distributed around the circle. Yeah. Uh, OK, another question. This one is from Ian Tabasco. Uh, can you say something about uh, curved dislocations? Is there something similar story if the dislocations are curved? No, no. Uh, actually, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, already um, um, so the, the, the study of curved dislocations, in, so modeling uh, curved dislocation is a very challenging problem. So uh, this analysis is really uh, only for this idealized model and uh, it's essential to work in, uh, in 2D. So also this extension to n dimension has no, uh, has no uh, applications to dislocations. So it's just an example to understand the role of anisotropy, but it's not related at all to dislocations. So the only case related to dislocations is for alpha equal to one in 2D because of this uh, uh, simplified geometry. But uh, for curved dislocations, well, of course, it would be very good to be able to say something, but already the modeling is, uh, is challenging. Okay, are there other questions from the audience? Oh, here we go. Uh, Ian has a follow-up. Um, uh, his comment is that Fourier multipliers can be degenerate on curves. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian, uh, so uh, Madison, would you like to uh, unmute Ian Tabasco for a moment? Yep, I'll do that for you, just one second. Uh, Ian, I, are you there? You're mute still. I'm still okay. I'm now muted, I think. Good. Okay. Uh, you I, want to elaborate on what your comment? Uh, maybe I missed the point that was made on the link between for, the degeneracy of the Fourier multipliers and the vertical nature of the dislocation a couple slides back. But my comment was that since you're playing around with the choice of um, the uh, anisotropy term in the interaction energy and thinking about it at the level of a Fourier multiplier. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm just wondering if that gives you a tool that can sort of look at curves uh, rather than lines. Yeah. Well, the point is that uh, for curves, really, you need to specify the model you are working with. So this kind of interaction is not... Uh, uh, is really computed for uh, dislocation lines that are straight and parallel in such a way to work in 2D. 
So um, you should uh, somehow compute, uh, well, first of all, uh, try to, to model uh, these location uh, curves and, uh, and then uh, trying to compute how they interact in, in the space. So the problem is somehow at the beginning. <laughs> I see. So the term that you chose is from a far field approximation and you're saying that if you have a curve, you have to somehow integrate over all of those. Well, it's not clear what you what you have to do. I mean, you, you need to, first of all, uh, decide how you model your, your curves and uh, how you describe the, the interaction between them. So it's really, so already the modeling is uh, a challenging question. Right. Uh, the, the point I think is that the curves could easily change their shapes. So density is not a good variable. And mm -hmm. uh, so then it's hard to get started. Yeah, uh, to get started is already a problem. One more question, uh, Chair's prerogative again. Mm -hmm. uh, so the origin of this problem as you described is from plasticity. Mm -hmm. Plasticity is really an evolutionary problem, dislocations, uh, in large numbers move around, uh, sometimes quasi-statically. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any chance of coming closer to that sort of evolutionary type problem from this viewpoint, even in this simple study? Well, that would be very interesting to do. This is something that we would like to do. And uh, actually, for edge dislocations, you should also include the fact that uh, edge dislocations can move only um, along uh, their Burgers vector. So if you start including time, you should also include the fact that your dislocations, so in this case, can move only horizontally. So this is something you should first include in your minimality problem and then include time. So this is something that we would like to do, but we still uh, <laughs> don't, uh, don't have. Okay. Well, there's more to do then. Yeah, um, of course, uh, certainly. Okay, uh, so I think there are no further questions and anyway, our time is up. Uh, okay. I want to thank you very much, Maria Giovanna. If we were in a physical room, we would be clapping, but uh, <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. virtually we're all muted. So consider that we have been clapping. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much for your wonderful talk. Thank you.